Okay, so my name is Kelsey Hughes. I work for Prince George's County Memorial Library System, and I'm so excited today to talk to you about programming. Um, programming is my passion. Teens are my favorite age group to work with, and I am so excited to talk about ways to take some of the needs for your teens that you've already identified, maybe the teens in your community um, that you aren't, haven't been able to quite work with yet, or the teens that you already are seeing in your branch that you want to do more for, and take those needs and really turn them into some exciting and high quality programming. So the age old question, the first question is how in the world do we actually know what programs they need? and maybe more importantly, what programs they want. Um, so as I already mentioned, you've, you've done a needs assessment already. You've already started to think about what are the interests of, of the teens in my community? What are the kinds of needs that, they, that you've identified that would be most useful to, for them, for you to fill with a program in the library? Um, so that's your first step. And that's really great to kind of map out what your community looks like. The next thing is that's, really good and really important to do is to ask them. Um, ask them what they want to see out of the library, but there is a key to this. I find that it is not particularly helpful to just ask them what the library can do for them or what they want the library to do for them. Because often, even if they are a teen who is in the library every single day, even if they're a teen who has come to your programs in the past, uh, without fail, the first thing that they will think of is, um, a service project that they're not actually very passionate about, but they think that's what you want to hear, or a book program because it's a library and they think that um, you should do something with books at the library. Um, and so they're not quite sure what the library is really capable of and what the limits are and what you're willing to do for them. And so rather than starting out by asking what, what they want you to do for them, Instead, just get to know who your teens are. Ask them what they're interested in. Ask them what they're passionate about. Ask them what they're scared of. Ask them what they're nervous about, what they're hopeful for in the future, what jobs they wanna pursue in the future. And then you take all that information, you gather it together, and then use your knowledge of what you know how to do, what skills you have to put things together, and what your knowledge of what your library is capable of doing and what your kind of goals are in the library to create a library program or a library experience for the teens based on those interests. Um, you wanna connect the interests that they have with skills. So maybe your teens are really passionate about YouTube. They really are, there's a YouTube star in particular they really love or TikTok. Uh, maybe they're really interested in TikTok and, and they, they communicate with each other about TikTok. Maybe um, you can turn that into a video editing program um, or creating you know, movie magic or movie tricks using uh, TikTok. And you can teach them how to do some of the, the things that they're seeing in the videos that they're watching. Um, or maybe you have teens who are really interested in manga and anime. Um, a manga and anime pro club is always, I find successful. Most libraries, no matter who your audience is, the manga and anime fans are there somewhere and appreciative that you thought of them enough to do a program. Um, but there's lots of ways you can go with that. Maybe you can um, use that to get their cosplay um, interests going and teach them how to do fashion design. Or maybe you can use that as a way to start talking to them about um, story development or um, how to draw or um, different cultures. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can connect this thing that they're interested in with maybe a skill or a different activity that they never would have thought that they would be interested in before. Um, also, I think it's helpful to do a little bit of, um, I don't want to say spying, but just being aware, right? So be aware of what the teens are doing when they're in your space. Sometimes they're shy and just asking them what they're interested in. They may not be comfortable opening up like that to you yet, but you might notice that all of them are checking out the same um, fantasy style books. So you might want to do something related to that fantasy series in your, in your library. You might notice that they're always hanging out and playing board games together, or they're all talking about this video game that they, they all have been playing at home when they're not at the library. These are all things you can clues you can kind of pick up on and then use that to, to transition it into um, a program. Um, also, be aware of what's going on outside of your library. There, there. If you, especially if you don't have teens already coming to your library, 
the first question you need to ask yourself is, well, where are they going? Because obviously there's teens in your community somewhere. Um, I like to say that no one goes straight from being an elementary school student to an adult. So there must be some teens somewhere. So the real question is, where are they? Um, maybe they're at the community center down the street. Maybe they hang out in the park. Maybe they hang out at the um, fast food restaurant down the street. That's where a lot of our teens hung out. Um, and so then it becomes a question of, well, why are they there and not at the library? How can I bring them to the library? Or maybe how can I bring the library to them if that works better for them? So all of the things I just talked about really feed into this idea of connected learning. And you'll be thinking about this concept a bit throughout your work on this module, um, but I wanted to talk about it briefly here. Um, connected learning is this idea that when we really leverage our teens' interests, the relationships they have with one another, as well as relationships they may be able to have with other um, adults, peers, colleagues, mentors in the world, and the opportunities they might have to flex those interests, to build on those interests and develop new relationships and um, experiences, then we are connecting their learning. We are truly building learning experiences for them that is connected to what they're interested in and can help them grow. Um, often in school, there's a limitation on what teens are really able to learn because there's a set curriculum, there are set goals that need to be reached by the school, there are tests they need to pass. In the library, we don't have those restrictions and that's a blessing because we can really be mindful of these things, these connections that we're able to foster and these interests that we know our teens have and really help them create their own learning that inspires their curiosity, that makes them feel seen and valued and makes them want to learn even if they don't realize that they're learning. So this is a really helpful framework for thinking about how we do programming. Often it's something we're already doing with our teens, but we don't have this name to put on it. And we don't have this consciousness of, um, of these pieces that we're, we're enacting. So these interest relationships and opportunities that we're growing for our teens. Now that we kind of have a sense of what the content of our program might be, we've thought about the interest and we've used that to think of what kinds of information or what kinds of activities we might like to do. Then we need to think a little bit more about the format and the kind of surroundings of the program. Um, so there's lots of different ways to do teen programming and a lot of it's gonna depend on what kinds of activities you wanna do, what kinds of interests your teens have, and what works best for your space. Um, so you can do a formal program like we're used to, um, just like our story times or our STEM programs, you can do a program where you have a very structured beginning and ending, you have some kind of steps that you wanna follow along the way and it's a very kind of cohesive space. Um, I will say that there's benefits to that and there's definitely gonna be times when you need to do that. And I think it's always important to have some formal element somewhere in the back of your mind, but often our teens are coming from school. And so having a really formal structure where they have to sit down and listen to a lecture or they're being told exactly what to do is going to be a turnoff for them. So it's a tool that you have in your tool belt, but it's not always going to be the most helpful tool. You can also do a more informal program. So that might be something where they can drop in and out depending on how much time they have to spend. We know our teens are often very busy. Um, it's an, uh, there's lots of different things that they can do. They have a lot of different choices that they can make. They have a lot of self-direction. It also could be either a passive program. And sometimes that's a really great way to start if you're not sure what they're gonna be interested in or if their schedules are really scattered and you can't really seem to find a time for a program that works. Maybe it's just putting materials out on a table so that when they're there hanging out, um, they're engaging with that activity. Or maybe it's something more active where you have a set time, you're really working with them on this project together. Um, a teen program can support both their professional, their personal and their academic interests. Often the best program does both simultaneously. So um, like I said, you know, you find, a, you find out that they really like YouTube, you do a video editing program, and then they are in turn able to use those video editing skills to um, maybe look at careers in video editing or maybe create a video for school based using the tools that they learned. So the best program really ties in both of those kinds of skills. Um, teen action groups, teen advisory boards, teen zones, teen times, there's a lot of different names, but the, this tends to be the most common and often most successful format of programming for teens, which is where you set a time that you know works for the majority of your teens every single week. Maybe it's every Tuesday at three o'clock right after school. Maybe it's every 
Thursday at 6 p.m. because they need to go home and get dinner first and then come back. You pick a time that seems to work well for the majority of your teens every week. Maybe it's every day. Some, some libraries do every day where your teen knows that if they show up at the library, there's going to be something happening. They don't necessarily know what the content will be. And hopefully if they're, you have a really dedicated group, they can actually be involved in creating that content with you but you have an opportunity, you, you have a, created a space where a teen knows I can always count on the library to have something cool going on when I show up on Wednesday at five. And so I know I'm always going to aim to keep my schedule clear to show up on Wednesday at five, because often, like I said, our teens are very overscheduled and they need to know that there's a certain time they can count on. And that can work a lot better than kind of scheduling programs all over the place at different times that they maybe don't have a ready clear spot for. Um, so that's one strategy that I've seen work. It works really well. Another reason this module tends to work well is because often when folks do a tag or a tab or a teen zone, they will provide service learning hours, even if the group doesn't necessarily always do a service learning project. Um, we do that at our library because we recognize that just by showing up and participating in the event, they're building community and they're giving back to their library and they're usually helping us grow our service to them. And so we view that as, as service learning um, and it helps get them in the door and be civically engaged and community engaged and that works for us. Um, and, so that, and so that's another thing to think about is that often it helps to have a hook. Maybe your hook is service hours. Maybe your hook is food. Food is often a great one. Um, teens like getting stuff. Um, and so as I mentioned, um, it really helps to build from passive to active if you're not sure. Maybe you always just have a stack of board games ready and when you see a group of teens hanging out, you, you know, don't look too eager, but you wander over with your games and say, hey, you know, I, I happen to have these games hanging around. Did you want to try some of them? You leave them, you let them be, but you have just kind of created a pop-up program for them. I think giving these kind of casual opportunities where A, they have an opportunity to say yes or no, but B, they, they kind of, you're kind of taking it, capitalizing on that moment when they're, when they're there and engaged in the library works a lot better than trying to kind of beg them to come to something that you don't know if it's going to work or not yet. It's a really good opportunity to play and try to learn your, your, your group. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to highlight is that, and I'm going to talk about this more in a bit, but um, you know, I often talk about the importance of creating learning goals and having learning goals in mind for your programs. I think that's really important for a lot of reasons, but what I want to highlight is that that doesn't mean that the program is or should be boring or feel like school. Um, like I said, it's really important that it doesn't actually. And so often you know in the back of your mind that they're learning those social skills, they're learning those collaboration skills or learning those hard um, coding skills, and they might not even realize that that's what they're working on. Let me talk a little bit more about those learning goals I just mentioned. So like I said, I think it's really important to have goals in mind for what you're trying to achieve. And there's a couple different reasons for that. The first reason is that it helps you make sure that your programs are doing what you want them to do. So if you just decide, oh, whatever, I'll just throw together some craft materials and give them to the teens and call it a day, you have no way of knowing once they're done using those craft materials if you've really um, achieved anything meaningful, right? But if you use this really helpful tool from Yalsa um, to define some learning goals, so maybe you want to do a paint night program for your teens, a paint, paint by numbers program for your teens, um, you might look at this list of, of goals from Yalsa, which has six different categories and say, okay, I wanna do a paint program. Um, what I'd really hope that they get out of this is under the um, creativity section, I want them to be able to think flexibly. Okay, so then you might think back to your painting program and think, hmm, well, I'm giving them paint by the numbers. So the numbers are telling them exactly what colors to paint and what things. Maybe I should rethink this a little bit so that they really are thinking flexibly and I'm not going to give them the numbers piece. I'm just going to give them maybe some prompts and, and allow them to be a bit more creative with their art. Um, or maybe you say, hmm, maybe instead of the, doing that, I can have them do um, a responsible remix. And instead, we'll use magazine images to create a collage. And, and we can talk a little bit about copyright usage at the same time. I'll sneak that in. They won't know that I'm talking about it, really, but that's what I'm talking about. And at the same time, they'll be engaging in personal expression. 
Um, so that's one way that I think it's really helpful to have these goals in mind because you can refine what you want to do. And again, know that you're having some meaningful impact on, on the teens while they're engaging in this, whether or not they're aware of it. And it can help make a stronger program as well. The second thing I think is really important is because often teen programs tend to be undervalued by the community and sometimes by um, even your colleagues in the library. It's often teen programs, it's harder to get attendance for and teens have a lot of fun and fun doesn't look like it has value. Fun doesn't look like it's meaningful. And so if you know in the back of your mind, okay, we're doing this paint program and it looks like they're just randomly throwing paint on the walls, but I know that they're building their ability to think creatively and flexibly. And I also know that while they're doing this, they're collaborating with each other because I'm asking them to, to paint on each other's canvases. So they're showing empathy and respect for each other's um, art or they're um, communicating effectively with each other and collaborating. Those are all things that you can have in your mind to, to defend yourself when someone is, you know, maybe bothered by the noise of the program, or if someone feels like, you know, uh, you should be spending your time on other things, you, it can help you make a stronger case for why teen programming is so important. Um, and then thinking about that even further, it also helps you advocate externally to have these goals in mind. So if you're applying for a grant, you'll be in, pra in the practice of knowing how to attach some real and hopefully measurable goals to your program. If you are advocating to your local government to support your teen programming in some way or to support your programming in general, you can talk about your teen programming as a piece of that because you'll have these goals in mind. So I just think it's so important and I love this tool from Yalsa because it really gives you that framework of ways to think about goals. And another piece of this that is, is touched on in that Yalsa resource, but I think is also important to cover here a little bit more in depth is social and emotional learning. So often we forget that um, or think that learning is hard learning only, right? But in fact, a lot of social and emotional learning happens in our programs and it can be the most common um, learning objective that happens because often we're having very social and interactive programs. And so while your teens are learning how to code, they're also possibly learning how to have self-awareness and self-management. So knowledge of their own emotions and how to manage them social awareness and relationship skills, so knowledge of other people's emotions and how to develop a relationship with them that takes into account other people's emotions and, and manages them as well. And then responsible decision making, which we know from our um, earlier, um, your earlier learning about brain development is one of the last skills that a teen develops. And one of the last things that develops in their brain is the ability to make logical and rational decisions. So it's really amazing if you're able to be conscious about incorporating ways to build in responsible decision-making into your work with your teens in a program, in a passive environment. And what I like about this graphic as well, which comes from the SEL, the Center for Advanced Studies of Social Emotional Learning, the, uh, it's kind of wrapped in these three bubbles, right? So the first place that they're probably learning this is in the classroom because they're there every day, all day, eight hours a day. Um, working in uh, amongst alongside other teens, right? So there, that's one space, but we remember that that's a very regulated space. And so there's only so many things that can be taught socially and emotionally while teens are also learning hard test-based content, right? Then you have your larger school environment. This might be an after-school club. This might be the kind of PTA that's, that's creating supporting programs. It might be just other interactions with teachers and administrations at the schools. That's another space where they're learning these skills. But then the last space we have these homes and communities and our family and community partnerships. And that's where the library really comes in. And I like that we're the kind of bubble that wraps around because we're able to fill in those gaps. We're able to see the places that the schools and the classrooms maybe weren't able to reach and really catch those students who maybe otherwise aren't being engaged or aren't getting the engagement that they're looking for and create some more opportunities for them. And then I also like this graphic, which talks more about the, um, the leadership piece. Um, youth like to be involved in the decisions that are being made. They like to have choice. They like for their input to be valued. They like to be treated like an adult. And so I think that really distinguishes teen programming from younger programming is that 
A program is more successful and teens get more out of it the more that they're allowed to be involved in the process of creating it. Um, so this is a really helpful chart to help us understand the range of ways a teen could be involved in the program that they're hoping to be a part of. Very bottom, we have manipulation, decoration, and tokenism. These are places we probably don't want our programs to be, right? We don't want our programs, our teens to just be there as decoration, not really enjoying themselves, but just maybe being counted as numbers in our stats to show, oh, we reached our teens, right? We don't really, that's not something we want. Um, as we start to move up, this the, the kind of deeper yellow may be where a lot of our teen programs are at, right? So we decide to have a program, we tell our teens, Friday at two, we're gonna have our art program, you're gonna be there and that's what we're doing, right? So they're told that it's happening. They might enjoy themselves, but they didn't really have a hand in helping create it. Um, then you start to move into where you're actually asking them what they want and if they're enjoying themselves and how things could be changed and what could be done differently in the future. Then you're actually bringing them more into the decision-making process. So you're not only consulting them, but you're actually allowing them to make some final decisions that have an impact on what you're gonna do. Then you're actually gonna allow them to take the lead. And then in the final step, if you're really able to do this, and this takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of commitment, it takes a lot of um, letting go that we can't always do all the time. So this is not to say that every program needs to be at this top level, but the final level here is where young people and adults are sharing responsibility to make all decisions with regard to your teen programming. That is a really difficult place to be. Um, and it's definitely not, like I said, possible all the time. But what I like about this graph is it lets us assess where we are and where we'd like to be and how we might be able to get there. And maybe some programs are on different levels depending on how involved the teens are and what the goals are and all that stuff. You don't have to be at the top all the time. But this helps us kind of create a, a, a way to look forward and maybe try to get ourselves to the next level wherever that is. All right, so learning environments, I'll do this quickly. Um, you know, this recess classroom, uh, the kids are overjoyed to throw out their papers and get out of there. So what that might tell you is probably we don't want our learning environments to look like that. We don't want desks all in a row facing the front that are really focused on the, the teacher, the person at the front of the room. So thinking about if your space is conducive to your goals. Sometimes you are going to be having a more structured program, something that really requires you to provide hands-on, step-by-step instruction how to do something. That's just the reality of some of the things that we want to do. And that's okay. Um, and in that case, you might need to create a, a space that feels more like a classroom, but I still don't ever think we want to get to this straight desks in a line situation. Um, other times you want to have discussion. You want the chairs to be facing each other or maybe no chairs. Can you have soft, comfortable furniture? Can they, do you have um, capability to let them sit on the floor if that's where they want to be um, or sit in the chair in a weird way because that's where they're most comfortable. The more you're able to allow teens to be themselves while they're participating, the more comfortable they're going to be in the program and the more they're going to enjoy themselves. So spaces that are flexible and adaptable to whatever meets the needs of your program and the needs of your teens is great. If you don't have a space, not all of us do. Um, mo many of us don't actually. Think about ways you can creatively show to the teens that the, this library is their library too. Maybe you can carve out one corner where in that one corner you have one bulletin board with a couple posters with YA books on it and maybe you can hang some of their artwork or some quotes from them or some pictures of the teens who come into your library the most. Something that lets them feel like this is their space too. And the most important thing is to get feedback often on that space. So even if it is just the bulletin board, ask them what they want to see on that bulletin board. If you do have a bigger space and, you know, maybe you are given a small budget to upgrade it, ask them what kinds of upgrades they want. Be careful not to overpromise because we all know that there are realities of, you know, there are limits to things we can purchase. There's limits to how much money we have. There's limits to all these different parameters that we have. So be open and upfront about those parameters, but allow them to work with you to try to make some decisions and some choices and feel like they're seeing their needs reflected in the space that you're creating for them. Okay, and then just to think about once you've created this awesome program, you have an amazing space to put it in, you have really made sure that your teens are involved in the process and you think it's going to be a great program and then you get to the day of the program how do you make sure that they actually show up 
Uh, this is uh, very difficult. I think teen programs are the hardest program to get attendance for. And I wanna say that very honestly, because it will be discouraging at times. And I think that's often why people don't do teen programming is because it's not like, it's not like story time where you advertise it and mm, parents will just be banging down the doors to get in to bring their kids there. Teens are more self-directed. They are less likely to use our traditional marketing channels. Um, they're not checking our website. They're not likely to go to something if their friends aren't going to it. Um, and they have a lot of different things taking up their time and distracting them. And so I have found that the most successful way to get the word out is to use their friends. If you can get one friend to come to one program and you encourage them to tell their friends about it, the next time you might get a second friend coming if you've really made it a good experience, slowly, 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 you may start to see that audience grow. It's going to take time. You're going to need to be really consistent. You're going to have to not get discouraged, um, but it can happen. And it often does happen if you're really willing to put the work in. Um, we had a teen program at one of our libraries. The first week they had zero teens show up. The second week um, they had two. Um, it took them four months. By, by the end of the four months, they had a handful of teens who were coming every time and then some other teens who are kind of coming in and out. So they were slowly starting to build that audience. That's a long time to go where you're not having the numbers, especially if your library system really places a high premium on numbers. And so you need to know in advance what, your plan is if teens don't show up and what your administration and what your supervisor is comfortable with um, if people don't show up and, and kind of how long you're willing to give this kind of test phase a go. Because I'm telling you right now, sometimes it's magic and it just works the first time. Most of the time it does not, especially if you don't already have that teen audience in place in other programs. Um, so be patient, be very clear about what your expectations are, be um, allow yourself to be present, pleasantly surprised by high numbers rather than disappointed by low numbers. Um, but also remember that when they do show up, these programs are so much fun. Um, teens are such an amazing audience to work with. And so I promise that it's worth the stress and it's really rewarding to, to get to um, work with people who are in such a, a rapidly changing and very exciting time of their lives.